All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Austin DSA Introduction to the Labor Movement. Uh, over the next four weeks, we'll be talking about various aspects of the labor movement, what folks in the local DSA are doing, and what the branch as a whole should be maybe thinking about future strategy. Okay. So uh, first, a few preliminaries. Uh, uh, my name is Joshua Fries. For those who don't know me, I've been a rank and file activist uh, in unions for the last 30, 30 something years. I started in ATU 1549 as a bus driver here in Austin. That was the smaller of two locals. Uh, we ran the UT shuttles and a handful of other routes. Uh, I started as rank and file, of course, was eventually elected to a local office and spent the rest of my time there as various officers in the local and settled into the recording secretary, which allowed me to put out the newspaper, uh, which is, for me, was a better position than being president, because the president needs to be able to occasionally sit down with management and have a conversation that doesn't degenerate into fighting immediately. And so uh, my comrade Glenn ran for president and I think did a better job than I did. I eventually messed up my shoulder uh, for workers' comp and lost the workers' comp case because Texas, uh, one, thinks if you're a worker, you're lying, uh, and two, doesn't believe that repetitive stress injuries exist. And as a worker with repetitive stress injury, uh, you can see where this story ends. So I uh, got a job at the airlines. I knew a lot of people were getting involved in airline unions. And so I got a job at US Airways, was very briefly stationed in Baltimore and transferred to Philadelphia, where I was a member of AFA Council Number 70 in Philly. Was mostly just a rank and filer there, but uh, I did get appointed to look, be an interim local officer for a little while when our local leadership imploded in a fit of childish squabbling and the national appointed three interim officers to keep things going until we could have elections and replace them. Uh, it was a little embarrassing, uh, but we did it. Uh, I worked there. I was laid off after 9-11, went back, eventually left, uh, ended up later after some twists and turns uh, back driving a bus again, much to my shoulder chagrin, uh, in ATU 1005, a much bigger local in Minneapolis, St. Paul, a uh, far more extensive transit system than, than Austin has. Uh, I was never an officer there. I uh, was part of a rank and file caucus and was also on the editorial committee that the education committee that part of the local's newspaper. Spent a little bit of time in Ask Me Local 25 driving a school bus outside of Detroit uh, in between some of those other ones. Uh, I was also in the IWW for a long time, part of that as the chair of the general executive board. So why are we doing this? Uh, the main reason is because there's no way to defeat capital without labor. Capitalism is oppressive in all kinds of ways, but at its root, it's primarily a system of exploitation of labor, a system of social control based on the imposition of work. And we're starting from a position where socialists mostly aren't in unions and unions almost entirely aren't socialists. And until those two things change, we're not gonna make major changes. More specifically, a lot of folks in the local DSA here are very interested in labor for all of these sensible reasons, but there's not as much experience because we live in Texas. There's not a great union culture because there's not a lot of union jobs. So people who grew up in the Northeast, in the upper Midwest, in the West Coast, were lucky enough if they didn't have a union job, they at least knew people who did, probably family members. We don't have that advantage, but we start where we are. Unions are a tool. A lot of liberal and left material makes us, you know, the oppressed out to be victims. Unions are the instrument that we, the working class, use to change ourselves from the passive observer of the world into the active driver. So uh, some preliminaries. This is the first of four sessions uh, that we have displaced Red Square for. Apologies to Red Square. We'll be back soon. Today, we'll look at how unions work and what they do. Uh, for time reasons, we have pushed the labor law section that was gonna to be today to the next two weeks. So next Wednesday at this time will be the private sector talk about labor law. 
for just a short time, and then looking at work that Austin DSA folks are doing in private sector unions or private sector labor work. Uh, EWOC, which is the Emergency Workers Organizing Committee, a joint project of DSA and the United Electrical Workers, one of the most democratic and militant workers in the country, the Restaurant Organizing Project, and the IBW, the Electricians Union. Uh, the following Wednesday, the first one in September, uh, June, whatever month that is, will be the public sector section, brief section on labor law again, and then we'll turn it over to a series of questions for the folks, uh, some folks in the branch who work in the public sector unions in TSEU, for the state employees, and ask me for the city and county workers. Finally, uh, the next, the final week, we'll look at some history of how the leftists have worked in what their union strategies have been, some moderate, some more modern ideas, uh, like the rank and file strategy, and then have a discussion, begin a discussion, this is going to be a long-term project, obviously, of what DS Austin should be doing with a labor strategy. Uh, final set of preliminaries, I promise. This is in the place of Red Square, but it is not Red Square. There will be more presentation here and less discussion. Uh, we are strictly focused on a single topic, the labor movement. It is broad, but we're talking about labor here. Uh, because we're not going to have quite as much time for discussion, we do ask that you limit questions and comments to a minute or so, so as many comrades as, as possible can participate. We're going to turn off the chat in a couple of minutes. It's really distracting to have things floating by at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and please mute yourself during the presentation and whenever you don't have the floor during uh, Q&A. Uh, if there's something that isn't clear or you have a question, please write it down so you don't forget because uh, I'd like to answer it if I can once we open the floor up. Okay, so having just established some ground rules like good revolutionaries, we're going to break them now. So I would just like people to uh, either in chat or shout out what, what they think the purpose of a union is. Why do we have unions? Shout out because I can't see where the chat is with the, thing, the screens I've got. So just holler stuff out. Why, what's the purpose of a union? We have unions because they provide for, uh, a way for workers who are weak individually to become powerful through uh, the organization of the many. Good. Why, why do workers want unions? What, what, what do they get from them? Like be, think of some concrete things. You know, they can win some demands in the workplace, like recently winning demands for a, a protective gear or uh, throughout history, better working conditions, uh, an eight hour working day, pensions, things like that, that make it possible for us to not just die. <laughs> Good, we don't wanna die. And we especially don't Gracie wanna says, uh, Gracie says to protect the workers, Jackie says power to the people and Andres, sorry if I mispronounced that, safety in numbers. Good. So we use unions for lots of things. And at the, at the, at the level of the workers, which is, is good, that was everybody's first instinct to go there, is they make us safer at work. We get better wages. We get better benefits. The reason we have jobs is perhaps if you're lucky because you like what you do at work. But it's really about what do we get out of it, right? We're there because we need a wage, we got to pay our rent, our mortgage, buy food, all that kind of good stuff. So, but when we ask what the purpose is, we should also think of what the, the purpose for whom, because it helps deepen our analysis a bit, because there's lots of other parties here besides the unions, right? There's the employers, you know, manifested in, and usually in the form of a, a, a boss or a set of bosses. There's the government, which is also another boss and employer. And because the government that we have now, the state was built by capitalists for capitalism, it acts an awful lot like a boss in a lot of ways. So what are they, what's the purpose of a union for them is to minimize conflict. They don't want workers standing up, but workers are gonna stand up and once they finally realized that, they thought, hmm, how do we save capitalism from the dumb capitalists? And the smart capitalists said, well, let's, let's create a way for them to vent some steam that's controllable. We're gonna kind of legalize unions, 
and see if we can put a damper on things. And it turned out that that kind of worked. But there's another party to all of this, right? That isn't separate from the workers, which is socialists. We have another vision of what unions are for. We don't share the desire to reduce strikes. We don't share the desire to minimize conflict because we recognize that minimizing that conflict is covering up an inherent difference between us and the owners of capital and the government. For us, unions are schools of revolution. Unions are where most people learn their revolutionary ideas. Most people, unlike probably many folks here, didn't get radicalized by reading Marx, reading Bakunin, reading some other interesting radical character from 200 years ago. Most people historically get radicalized by struggle. I wanna tell you a story about the first union job I ever had when I was a bus driver here in Austin, and this was a long time ago. We'd just gone through a major set of conflict. We had a wildcat strike. We'd had a very successful uh, contract campaign where we really just kicked the company's ass up and down the street, won everything we wanted, gave up nothing. So this is, you know, a few weeks, a few months later, and a bunch of us are sitting there waiting for the driver shuttle to take us back to the garage. And these two guys, not people I knew well, I mean, they were in the union, they were involved, but they weren't, you know, super active. One of them I knew reasonably well, he was a high school graduate. The other guy, I'm not sure. But these two guys are sitting there talking and one of them asked the other, why do we have management? And these guys talk for a little while and come to the conclusion that everything management does that's useful, we can do. We know how to run this. And all the other stuff they do is superfluous and a waste of time and energy. These two guys with a high school education maybe invented the most revolutionary democratic socialist idea there is. They invented the workers' council, the Soviet economic democracy, call it whatever you want. They invented this idea. Having just gone through all of these fights, they recognized the fundamental necessity of the revol socialist revolution, which is that we, the working class, can run the economy and do not need capital. Okay, so uh, now we're going to uh, go into the actual part of this. So I'll uh, ask Patrick or whoever has a finger on the button. We are going to uh, cut off the chat for a while because I, like I said, I find it very distracting uh, and look at some really depressing numbers about the current state of unions. Uh, sadly, it, things are not good as you probably know. You probably wanna get your whiskey out because these numbers are really unpleasant. This is a graph of union density. Union density is the number of union workers over the sum of union workers and non-union workers. Uh, if you look at this graph, I started, I picked, started in, the, in the early 30s or mid 30s, about the end of the Great Depression. And things looked really good for a while through the 40s and 50s and even into the early 60s, things were looking pretty good. And then it starts sliding down. In 1980, it slides down really fast for a while and it just starts sliding down slowly again. Those of you with eagle eyes will notice that it looks like there's a little uptick in 2020. Uh, I hate to burst your bubble. Uh, that's almost certainly a COVID artifact because lots of people lost their jobs in 2020. A few union people lost their jobs, but union people lose their jobs less because they have unions to protect them. A lot of non-union people lost their jobs. So uh, I'm gonna get a little mathy with you for a second, but just for a second, if you have a fraction and the denominator, that's the bottom part, gets smaller, then the whole fraction gets bigger. And that's what happened, is a lot of non-union people lost their jobs. So it looks like we organized a bunch. I wish that happened, that isn't what happened. In 2019, uh, uh, union density in the United States was 10.3%. In Texas, it was about 4%. So that little uptick that makes it look like it was 
and Texas numbers say 4.9% is probably not actually true. So take a drink. There's another way of looking at the same kind of information, major strikes, which are generally defined as a thousand or more workers. Uh, I couldn't find any numbers for this before the late forties, but numbers look really good for a while, right? A few hundred a year, and then it starts dropping and then it starts going up again. So there are two interesting stories about this. The first interesting story is if we go back, we'll see union density doesn't really start dropping until the early 60s or so. But strike numbers start dropping before then, in the mid 50s. Unions were formally legalized under the Roosevelt administration in the 30s and 40s. And there was a huge burst of organizing for several years. But this led to a negative as well, which is unions began becoming more bureaucratic. They became, they were becoming less manifestations of workers in motion and more tying the workers movement to capitalist productivity. And they were, capitalists were successful in using this in chaining us to unions in a way that reduced our struggle. We got more pay. We got more benefits, but some deals were made at high levels and unions largely agreed to quit talking about two things. They agreed to quit talking about the length of the work day, the length of the work week, after driving it down by 50 or 100% over the last, the previous 100 years, and they agreed to quit talking about control of the workplace. And they became bureaucratic and they became more bureaucratic and strikes started dropping. So the next interesting story is what happens? Why does it go back up again starting in the 60s? Well, what else was going on in the US then, right? The civil rights movement starts in the 50s and accelerates through the 60s. The black power movement shows up. The second, uh, the, 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 the second stage, uh, of the, fem the, sort of the second wave of feminism, the lesbian and gay movement, the environmental movement, the student power movement, the anti-war movement, there's a lot of upheaval in the United States. And the labor movement doesn't stay out of this. What's different about the second upsurge is that it's more driven from the ground. There were a lot of wildcat strikes and there were a lot of unions that were forced to strike by their members over the desire of the staff and officers. It was a, a very different time in unions. This is the time when the, the rank and file workers caucuses began being created in unions by our ideological predecessors. Uh, sadly, uh, we didn't have a socialist revolution and numbers started dropping. And so you can see as we go along that look, numbers look really depressing. And for the last 10 or 20 years, we're doing good to get into the teens and 20s in major strikes per year. This is another way of looking at the same information. This one was strikes, just pure numbers of major strikes. This is the number of workers in thousands. So you see at the peak, we're doing pretty good, right? We got two and a half or three million people a year going out on strike. That's great. And then, you know, as we imagined, it starts falling. But something very interesting happens two years ago, right? We're going along, things are bad, things are bad, things are worse, things are worse. Then in 2018 and 2019, to a lesser degree, there's this big upsurge. That was the public education strike. West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma, uh, Kentucky, I believe. It was a great year. <laughs> we, we won a lot that year and surprised a lot of people, in, including ourselves. So uh, moving on to some more depressing news, right to work. You've all heard the phrase, what does it mean? Well, the narrow definition of right to work means no closed union shops. What's a closed union shop? A closed union shop, closed union contract means the employer cannot hire anybody who isn't in the union. That seems like a pretty reasonable thing, right? We want everybody in the unions. Well, it turns out employers don't want that. Uh, closed shops are actually illegal under federal law. 
So why is there still all this right to work movement? Because the colloquial definition includes a whole lot of other anti-worker regulations. Not only do they not want closed shops, a step down from a closed shop, and I'll give you some better definitions of these later, is a union shop. A big step down from there is an agency shop where there's some fair share, where even if union mem uh, workers aren't in the unions, they have to pay something for the good that they get from them. And it also generally includes the, 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 the permanent replacement of strikers, meaning if you go out on strike and your boss hires a bunch of scabs to replace you, and then you settle the strike, you're not entitled to your job back. They can keep the scabs. Uh, usually also includes at will employment, which means your boss can fire you for any reason or no reason. There are a handful of reasons your boss can't fire you for. He can't fire you because you're black. He can't fire you because you're Mexican. He can't fire you because you're a woman. He can't fire you uh, because you're disabled. He can't fire you because you're wearing a union pin. But if your boss has more than two brain cells to rub together, then all he, then he knows he does, all he has to do is not say any of those things. He just says, I'm firing you and not tell you why. If you want to claim that it's for one of those protected reasons, you can try. But the burden of proof is on you to prove that that's the reason you were fired then. And you can imagine how friendly uh, the courts are. Uh, the other thing it includes uh, is a restricted or prohibited public sector union rights. In Texas, uh, it's illegal for the state, the county, the city, a public hospital, a municipal utility district, any government subdivision of the state of Texas, they cannot negotiate with a union. Uh, some more depressing news. More than half the states in the country are right to work. A uh, pretty good, pretty decent majority from their perspective. Most of them went right to work when they were first allowed to do so in the uh, late 40s, 50s, even in the 60s. But in the last 20 years, seven more have joined their ranks. Alaska, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Oklahoma, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, some of which are traditionally union-friendly states. Uh, eight have gone as far as putting right to work in the state constitution. This doesn't affect things much on a day-to-day -day basis, but as you might imagine, it makes it, it'll make it much harder to change it. Even if we elect a majority in those states of socialists, say, or you know, even wishy-washy Democrats who agree that they don't like right to work laws, you can't do it without changing the state constitution. Most of the right to work states are smaller states, uh, except for Florida and Texas, which are the second and third largest. But in general, they're smaller than average. In spite of that, they still have a majority of uh, workers, a majority of American workers live in right to work states. And it does what they want. Correlation may not be causation, but if you take all the states and put them in a row from the most unionized, you know, Alaska and New York, and all the way down to the least unionized, in the bottom half, the bottom 25, 23 of them are right to work. In the top 25, four are right to work. And they're from that list that went right to work in the last couple of decades. Okay, uh, enough really depressing stuff for a while. Mm, that's good. So what do unions do? We talked about why we have them, but what concretely, what, what, what does a union activist do? What does a union officer do? Well, there's several pieces of this and I'll talk about some of them. Recognition. This is a legal term that is essentially means the process where a union somehow gets the boss to talk to them. We know about contracts. This is the agreement between the union and management. Representation, communications. Unions have some kind of communication network, hopefully a good one. They have a whole passel of tools they use to get what they want. And they do a lot of different kinds of politics inside outside and what I'll call capital P politics, which you can think about for a little while and probably figure out what I mean. So recognition, how to get the employer to deal with the employees. Why does the boss want to deal with the United Workforce? He doesn't. He absolutely has no desire to do that because as an individual, as Patrick was saying earlier, the boss has more power than you do. It's just as simple as that. 
So a better question is, how do we force him to deal with us? There are various answers to this, but there's two basic ways. There's the lawyer's power route, and then there's a the worker's power route. The lawyer's power route is the route most unions take. It's sort of easier in that you don't actually have to do nearly as much organizing of the membership. There's a legal route wherein you provide the government entity, you probably the National Labor Relations Board if you're public sector, with enough cards that says there's an interest in having a union election here and you have an election. That can work. Uh, just a second, my computer is telling me it's very sleepy uh, because I seem to have unplugged it. Okay, so that can work, but if you don't do an awful lot of organizing at the same time, it's gonna, even if you manage to win the election, which as we saw in Alabama uh, is unlikely, it's gonna be very hard then to muscle enough strength to force the boss to give you what you want. Many unions get recognized and never get a first contract because even if you win the election, in theory, the boss is obligated to negotiate with you, but he's not actually obligated to give you anything. That's not part of the law. So if you wanna actually win, you have to organize your coworkers. You have to get them ready to fight and that's hard, but it's the only way to actually win. So you win, you get a contract. What is a contract? It's in theory, a legally binding document between the union as the representative of the workers and the employer. It's a snapshot of the union power at one point in time. And it's important to remember that just because management signs a contract doesn't mean they have any intention of following it. Mostly they don't. So, but let's get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. It's not as interesting as strikes, but it's important to understand how the, how the process works. There's several ways of, of, of recognition, of getting a union. You, uh, one way of thinking about it is, is uh, what I'm calling scale. How big a unit, how, how much does the contract cover? You can have a contract that's just a single location. You know, there's one, store here in Austin and the workers organize and they get recognition at that store. Maybe the company has other stores in Austin, maybe it has other stores in Houston, maybe it has other stores in Shanghai, I don't know, but that's sort of the smallest unit. You can have a single employer contract where you have all of the employer's locations. We're getting bigger now, right? Because that's where the power is. In a store, you know, you might be able to pull one location off. But if you think about something like manufacturing, if you organize one plant and your employer has another plant, guess where all the new work is gonna go? Hint, it isn't your plant. So ideally you want some kind of master agreement where you cover, well, you, you know, you want, you want, first you get all the locations of one employer, but you can't stop there because then your employer in the capitalist world is, is gonna be outmaneuvered by the other capitalists. So you've gotta get the rest of them in too. A master contract is a contract that applies to multiple employers generally in the same industry. The Teamsters were excellent at this in their early days. James R. Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa, the old dead one, not the young idiot who runs the Teamsters now. For all Jimmy Hoffa's flaws, and there were many, he was a damn good organizer. He, he learned his craft from Farrell Dobbs, who if you've heard of the Minneapolis General Strike of 34, Farrell Dobbs is one of the main organizers of that. And he mentored a young Hoffa and taught him how to organize. Dobbs and the other progenitors of the Minneapolis Strike were, you won't be surprised to learn, uh, radical socialist activist. <laughs> Dobbs spent a fair amount of time in prison for a point for opposing the US government. So the Teamsters, uh, under Hoffa's uh, excellent organizing, organized a master agreement and they forced almost every trucking company in the country into that master agreement. 80 or 90% of trucking, local and over the road, 
if you saw a truck hauling something, chances were damn good there was a Teamster driving it and it was going to a warehouse with a bunch of Teamsters who were going to unload it. In the late 70s and early 80s, Carter and then Reagan deregulated the trucking industry to make it easier for non-union companies. And the Teamsters fell down on the job. They had gotten lazy. Hoffa was dead and had long since sold out to the mob anyway, and was replaced by other mobsters and corrupt officials who were running the union into the ground. So from those days to now, the ratio is reversed. We've gone from 80 to 90% of trucking run by Teamsters to maybe 10%. It's, a, again, another really depressing number, but that's what happens if you don't remain vigilant in your unions. So the master agreement took the competition out from truckers. Trucking companies can compete however they want, but they weren't gonna do it on the backs of the drivers and the workers in the warehouse. A pattern agreement is similar to a master contract. The UAW in theory does this, although they don't do it very well anymore. The UAW has three main contracts, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors. And they have a bunch of other stuff now. So, you know, they have some grad students and a bunch of other stuff. But traditionally, those were their three main contracts. A pattern agreement, they, they would look at which of the three was weakest, which one they thought they could kick around the most, and they'd start with them. And they'd get as much as they could out of them. And then they'd go to the other two and says, this is the deal. And there were minor differences, but they would enforce the pattern on the other ones once it was established. And they were quite good at it back in the day. Finally, they're industrial contracts. We don't really have those in the United States. Uh, if you're familiar with the German system, they do. And most heavy industry workers are covered by an industrial agreement and the union negotiates for everybody in the industry. And that prevents anyone who is outside the union, any employer from undercutting the union jobs. Uh, a different way of looking at a contract or a union is who it covers. Earlier unions, which had sort of inherited their ideas from the old guilds were craft unions. They were high skilled, very narrowly focused. You see this in the construction industry, you know, a building in New York being, might have 20 different unions at various times on the site. Uh, and unfortunately, half of them hate each other and are busy undercutting each other and offering the boss deals. It's a terrible way to organize, which is why a hundred years ago or more, a lot of workers realized this is a terrible way to organize. We need everybody in the same union. And beginning with the Knights of Labor, the industrial workers of the world, later the CIO, that became the dominant model because it worked. It took the competition between unions out. You know, if we don't want workers to compete with each other, why on earth would we want our unions to compete with each other? That's absurd. So the industrial union where everybody in a UAW plant from, you know, the person sweeping the floor to the person you know with the rivet gun to the person putting glass in the front to the engineers designing the electrical systems of the car they're all in the uaw and they're all in the same contract i'm not saying they all get paid the same but they're all in the same contract which is a great start finally i promise to tell you about shop types closed shops once again employer can't hire anybody unless they're in the union a union shop is a step down, but not a huge one. It says you can hire someone who's not in the union, but they have to join within a period of time, usually 30 days or so. Uh, an agency shop is another big step down. Agency shop has what's called, uh, uh, you, you, you don't have to join the union, but you have to pay fair share, it's called. The theory is, even if you're not in the union, the union does a lot of work for you. It protects you from violations of the contract. It negotiates better wages and benefits for you, all that good stuff. So you pay an agency fee. It's usually something in the neighborhood of 80% or so. What you don't get to do is vote on contracts, vote for officers, vote on anything because you're not a union member. It's sort of a way for people who think they're rugged individualists or just hate unions for whatever the reason to thumb their nose. They don't get much out of it. It's, it's one of those, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face things, but a few people do it. I've been, when I was in the airlines, that's essentially the agreement. You, 
you have to either join the union or you pay an agency fee. Almost everybody joins the union, uh, but there's a few idiots who, you know, who think they're somehow accomplishing something by doing that. Finally, we get to Home Sweet Home in Texas with the open shop. That means you don't have to join the union ever. You don't have to pay an agency fee, but the law still requires the union to do everything for you that it does for anyone who's in the union. It's a horrible situation. Get used to it. <clears throat> it does. The advantage, the one advantage is that it does force union officers to continue organizing all the time because on a day to day basis, there doesn't appear to be any reason for members not to leave because they get everything tomorrow that they got today. Now, you and I understand that in the long run, it means it weakens the union, but it does force people to stay good organizers and not become nearly as lazy as union officers can if they have a closed shop or a union shop or even an agency shop, or at least they get the money even if they don't get the membership. This is not a plug for open shop. I'm just looking for a little, a, a little, little light here. Contracts, what's in a contract? Lots of sections and contracts. Uh, I'm gonna run, quickly run through a handful of them. Wages, right? Benefits, sick days, vacation days, pensions, whatever. Work rules, these are the things you have to do or the things that you're not allowed to do when you're at work. Job classifications, what's covered by the contract if, you, if I'm in this classification, can I do the work of that? Am I prohibited from doing it? What's the mechanism to move between them? So on. Safety, uh, as folks were saying earlier, this is a critical part of unions because we don't want to die at work. Um, let's see, I don't know if you can see my little picture, but if you can, this is the Longshore, con oops, uh, where it was the camera. This is the Longshore contract for the West Coast Longshore. This is their safety contract. You'll notice it's not that much smaller than the, than the contract itself. And that's because docks are a dangerous place to work. And so over the decades, the ILWU has negotiated an astonishing level of safety protections for the members. Discipline. So you have these work rules. If you violate them, what happens? With the union, if it's worth its salt, you don't just get fired right away because your supervisor is having a bad day or they don't like you or whatever. In the bus contract I worked in here in Austin, we had several categories that didn't overlap, which was great. So we had work rules, we had route and schedule violations, and then we had, I can't remember what it was called, really serious stuff. So work rules were, you know, if you show up late to work, you know, if you didn't, you know, pick up the trash in your bus at the end of your shift, you know, stuff like that. There was a rolling one year period and in that period, you could get six or seven work rule violations before you got fired. You'd start with, for some reason, we called it a verbal warning, even though it was written. Then you'd get a written warning, which looked just like a verbal warning, except it said written at the top instead of verbal. Sooner or later, you'd get suspended. And if you kept going in the space of a rolling year, you could eventually get fired. But you had a lot of chances to, to not get fired. Route and schedule violations, you know, if you're falling behind or running late and you don't tell them or you go off route for no, for, for, you know, without telling them without a good reason. Again, you had several, five or six of those you could get, but they didn't interfere with root rules. You could have five or six of one and four or five of the other and you were okay. The really serious category, this was, you know, if you punched a passenger uh, or had a, a major uh, accident that was your fault because, you know, you really, you just screwed up and ran into a telephone pole or whatever, uh, or you came to work drunk. Uh, it's worth noting, though, that for drug and alcohol violations, we did have a second chance. You could go, uh, go to rehab, come back. For a while, you'd have a bunch of extra random drug tests or whatever. But if you stayed clean, you eventually quit being subject to extra, extra ones and got your job back. Uh, if you got a second one in the space of some period of time, it was a couple of years or so, you could, you, we couldn't do anything for you then, unfortunately. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not really sure I want someone who can't come to work sober driving a 20 ton vehicle. So eh, that's kind of a hard one to argue too much about. Uh, there's a seniority clause in there, which essentially seniority is primarily about ending favoritism. The good work doesn't go to the management's favorite people. The good work goes to the person who's been there the longest. 
every year or three times a year or whatever, you pick work, you bid on work, different unions use different language and all the work goes up on the board and the most senior person goes in and picks the work they want. And then the next senior person and so on down. That means when you start, it can be kind of rough because you're getting the work nobody else wants, but you move up the seniority and life gets better. Scope. Scope is very similar to classification. Sometimes they're used to mean the same thing, but scope is used to, as the definition of scope is used to prevent management from farming out your work to a non-union location or to a union that's undercut you. Airlines use this term, uh, pilots unions especially. If you fly on, if you go on a trip and you're flying on what I'll call sort of a, a normal aircraft, you know, holds 120, 150, 200, maybe it's a wide body aircraft and it carries three or 400 people. That's covered by an ALPA contract, Airline Pilots Association. ALPA has a clause with that airline that says, any aircraft that has a hundred or more passengers is in our scope. If it's in your route structure, we're flying that plane, period, end of story. Uh, now, without defending, I can't defend ALPA too much because they've let the smaller planes uh, go to hell in a handbasket. The people who are flying those smaller planes are making twenty-five dollars or $35,000 a year working terrible schedule because ALPA is run by the guys who are flying 767s and large Airbuses. Uh, and by guys, I mostly mean guys because there's almost no super senior pilots who, fly, who get in those big planes because ALPA kept women out as long as they could. <clears throat> so I can't defend ALPA. But the scope idea is an important one nonetheless. Prevent the boss from undercutting your work. Duration, when does the contract start? When does it end? Grievance. Grievance is what we call, it is the method that the union uses to enforce the contract between contracts. If the boss violates the contract, you file a grievance, usually to a low-level supervisor. If they deny it, then you file, you know, there's usually two or three tiers. Maybe it goes to a manager and then maybe to a high-level manager. If you get all the way to the top grievance level, which is pretty common, then you have the right to go to arbitration. In theory, an arbitrator is an outside neutral party. The, 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 the union and the company have agreed to some arbitration outfit. You write them, they send you a list of three or five or some odd number of arbitrators. The union and the company have done a lot of research and they know who the ones are that they don't like and they take turns striking ones until there's only one left. Um, this usually results in a bad arbitrator because there are a lot fewer arbitrators from the union side than there are from the company side. At least that's my experience. Uh, but it's an option and you can win them. And I've, you know, we've won, I've seen, I've been part of winning arbitrations before. The grievance and arbitration replaces your ability to strike. Almost every contract in the country has a no strike, no lockout clause during the length of the contract. You can't strike, they can't lock you out. Furthermore, US labor law assumes you have one of those even if you don't put it in the contract. The theory is if you have grievance and arbitration, then that replaces your right to strike. There's a handful of unions that still have the right to strike written into their contract. I think there are still some UAW contracts that say under these situations, we can still strike during the contract. The ILWU has these stop work meetings, which I think they've mostly given away the right to in the last five or 10 years, unfortunately, but they use those to great effect uh, against, uh, against hot cargo from other countries like apartheid South Africa uh, and Chile under Pinochet and so on. There's also usually a management's right clause. If you can keep this out, but management likes to put in a list of things they have the right to, and then a clause at the end that says, and everything else or something like that go to the wall, because if there's an end everything else clause, then they can do whatever they want that isn't in the contract and you don't have the right to negotiate about it. New stuff happens, new work comes in, whatever your job is, you wanna be able to negotiate that. If it's something new, then it's something different. 
and you want to be able to have a say in how that's going to be done. Lots of other clauses. I can show you contracts sometime over a beer. So more about contracts a little bit. If you want to get a good contract, it takes a lot of preparation because you need to be ready to strike. And the company needs to know you're ready to strike. This means your membership has to be ready. The users of whatever it is you make have to be ready. The public, your allies, the media, you have to have done a lot of work going in to be ready if you're going to get a good contract out of it. Because if the company isn't scared of you, they're not going to give you anything. They don't care if you pound on the table. They don't care if you scream and holler a lot. If they're not scared of you, they're not going to give you anything. And what makes them scared of you is if they think you're a wild dog and might walk out. The last contract that I was involved in in the bus shop uh, before I messed up my shoulder and left, we cleaned their clock. There was a brand new contractor who'd come in. They, were, they didn't even know when they were awarded the contract by Cap Metro, which had, you know, our work was privatized out, it was subcontracted from Cap Metro. They didn't even know there was a union here. But they came, they thought, oh, this is Texas. We're just going to run over those hicks. It didn't work out like that. We had built up our membership from a low of, you know, before they were here, probably less than 50% to 90 some percent. We had more activity in the union than he'd ever had before. Students had come to us. You know, act, you know, student activists had come to us when they heard that, you know, there was a fight coming on and said, how can we help? And formed a group to support us, got the student government to support us. We, we went together to the Daily Texan, the UT paper, and made friends there. We made friends at the Chronicle. We even had someone at the Austin American Statesman, a reporter who was on our side, and we were ready to go. At the last minute, you know, the contract extension, we've given them notice that the contract extension is going to expire. They brought a bunch of scabs in, ready at hotels in Austin from their other locations. And we tell them at the last minute, while they have all these scabs in hotels, uh, we're, no, we're just, we, the, you know, we have a vote in the union, which they know about, saying, we're not going to strike tomorrow. We give a small group of people the right to call a surprise strike when they feel like it. So the company is spending all of this money on scabs who aren't working. And meanwhile, we're still working and they're paying us. They could lock us out if they want, but that's, that's not gonna look good for them because they're required to keep these buses running and they don't have enough scabs to keep all the buses running. And they're gonna be new people who don't know the routes anyway. So at the last minute, I mean, it really is one of those, you know, 1159 kind of things we get a call saying, in short, here's everything you want. It was just amazing. And it was very, it just, and for years after that, you know, people talk, you know, the, the, the members there just look back at that as this amazing moments, like this is how it's done. Because that's how you have to prepare. It was a lot of work. None of us got any sleep for a year, but that's how you have to do it. Uh, I'm running a little behind where I want to be, so I'm going to whip through some of this. Uh, negotiations for contract, it's important who's at the table. Most unions send top officers, maybe not even anyone from, maybe one person from the local, somebody from the international or national, and a lawyer who does all the talking. And they don't let any of the members know anything until the very end. They sign a gag order. So at the very end, they bring a contract to the members. They say, you have a day to look at this. They give you a list of highlights. That is the good things that change. They don't tell you any of the bad things uh, and they make it very difficult even to get a copy of the contract. This is not democracy. It's not a way to build power, but it is the way most unions do things. Don't do it that way. <laughs> so you've got a contract you've, or you've got representation. I mean, you've, you've got recognition or you've got a contract. What happens now? The union shifts somewhat to representation. Now you have to defend this contract. Like I said, the company has no intention of following it. They're going to violate it every chance they get. So you've got to stay on top of that. That's what the grievance procedure is about. That's what arbitration is about. And that's what you have other power to do. You know, we didn't have the right to strike at the bus shop in between contracts. 
but we had very flexible time off. So going into that last contract about a year before that, we had a picnic. The union announced on a Friday afternoon, the last day of the UT semester during work, we didn't say that part in our publication, we were gonna have a picnic and provide free beer and hamburgers. And all the officers were very careful to say, this isn't a strike, we're not telling you to take off work. And all the non-officer activists were going around saying, if you don't come to the picnic, you're a fucking scab. And we shut the place down. We were sued and even, you know, the Texas, you know, it was a, a, a federal judge, but you know, here in Texas, they tend to be more Texan, agreed, it's like, well, all of our publications said it wasn't a strike. It was just having a party in the park on the last day of, of the semester and threw it out. So you can win even in Texas, but you do got to play your cards right. Uh, very quickly, some contract alternatives. It's not the only way to get what you want. Uh, in fact, the IWW at its high point never signed contracts. They would say, oh, we want this to change. And if the boss said no, then we make their life hell. And when the boss goes back on it, then we fight again. It's harder. The advantage is it keeps you in fighting form because the boss is always gonna try to cheat you. If you have a contract, then it gives, there's, there's a chance to forget how to fight. A lot of unions have started signing these really long contracts, you know, five years, seven years, longer. That gives you too long to forget how to fight, both as a union and as members. So short contracts, I'm actually not opposed to. One year, three years, I feel like is getting a little bit long, although most of the ones I have been in have been three or more. But there's a reason I don't like them. It's because they give you that time to forget how to fight. Unions should be a bastion of communications, up and down and left and right and all over the place. Most unions have some degree of one-way communication. They have a newspaper or something newfangled like email and text that goes from the top to the members. Some don't, but most have some version of that. Hopefully there are regular meetings where you can all communicate, the leadership and the membership can communicate. Hopefully the officers and the staff are available. Ideally, you have a huge system of stewards. Stewards uh, or delegates or whatever you wanna call them are the people on the shop floor. They're not sitting in an office somewhere far away. They still work in the workplace and they're union representatives. And they're sort of the person on the shop floor who's there that you, people respect, that they go to, that knows the contract, that knows what you have to do, knows what you can get away with. And ideally, you should probably have about one for every 10 workers. That's a lot, especially in a big, uh, a big contract, but it, it's a much better communication network because it keeps information flowing up and down and keeps it from getting centralized at the top or isolated at the bottom if you have a set of officers who don't really care what's going on at the bottom. Horizontal communication, you should have some level of departmental uh, union structure, because what goes on in a given department is different than the others. That's why there's different departments. So you can talk to each other about what needs to change. Most unions have committees or caucuses. These could be something, you know, a civil rights committee, a women's committee, you know, an LGBTQ committee. Uh, caucuses, sometimes those committees are called caucuses. Most unions will have something like a communications committee that puts out the newspaper. The other kind of caucus is a political caucus, and that's more like the ones that we have in DSA. These are ideological structures to some sort, and that's where the rank and file strategists started in the 60s and 70s. They created Teamsters for a Democratic Union and the Teamsters. This is not an official Teamster body. The leadership of the Teamsters does not approve of it, but so what? It's essentially the opposition party in the Teamsters Union that fights for a more democratic and more militant union. Uh, the UAW had one called New Directions. Uh, they actually have an, a new one just in the last few years, which the name is eluding me. The transit workers in New York also had a group called New Directions. They were in a lot of industrial unions uh, where folks, when, when, when the old uh, uh, international socialist folks 
uh, who were largely responsible for the, the theory behind the rank and file strategy, when they industrialized in the 60s and 70s, they created these organizations. So tools, lots of tools unions have. Most unions, when they go in, will try to get some kind of outside pressure, get some politicians to come and talk, maybe some religious leaders, you know, write some letters, get the meet, try to get the media to at least cover it, some kind of embarrassment, you know, that the boss is being mean to us. That's important, but it's mostly not going to work. Uh, it's it's important. It's good to have as part of a strategy, but it's not enough by itself. You have to have an inside strategy because your strength against the boss is the workforce, is you. You probably can't start with a strike, though, because the fact is most workers are not automatically convinced of necessity. You've got to build up to that. And that's part of what your strategy as a socialist union worker is. You start with little things. Let's everybody wear a pin that says, you know, we're not working without our, our safety gear, whatever. You know, you wear T-shirts. That doesn't, that doesn't work. But it starts to make the boss a little bit nervous because he sees a huge percentage of the people doing that if you've done your homework right. So during lunch break at 12.37, everybody stands up and blows a whistle or claps for 30 seconds. And then they sit back down and go back to their lunch. This is incredibly disconcerting to bosses. They're control freaks. They don't like things like that because they understand where this is going. When they see workers united, it scares the shit out of them, and it should. Maybe that's not enough, though. So you start, but your members are like, oh, well, we've got something going now. Now you've got people willing to take another step. So you start a petition, which you don't give to the boss until you have a whole lot of signatures on it, because you don't want to give them a small handful of people. But if, and you tell your members, we're not going to give it to them until we have you know 30% or 100 people, whatever. You pick, pick a number, right? Some impressive number and you give it to the boss. Slow escalation to scare the boss, hopefully into giving you what you want, but to prepare the membership. So the petition doesn't work. So you get a bunch of people and you just walk into the boss's office one day in the middle of work and say, we need to talk about this. And you bring you know, 10 or 20 of your friends or however many you can possibly fit in the door. Ideally in the middle of work, so stuff stops. This is getting very scary. And this is the point where if it doesn't work, people are starting to get angry because they've, they've done all of these things. And I'm not saying it's automatic, but it's part of a process to preparing membership who may not already be socialists, who probably aren't already socialists and are nervous about day one going out on strike. And strikes, of course, that's our main power. That's our power is to refuse to work. There's lots of kinds of strikes. The one people usually think of is, you know, everybody out and stay out. We all go out and we stay out until the boss gives in. That's powerful if you can pull it off and if the boss can't replace you. But I was in Detroit during the Ampha strike, uh, the machinists, the mechanics at, at, at uh, uh, Northwest Airlines before they merged into Delta. And this was an incredibly high skilled group of people, Air, aircraft mechanics. There's not a whole lot more complicated machines out there that a person can work on than a modern aircraft. And they were convinced, this was, a, this was a militant, very democratic union. But they were missing a piece of the strategy because they thought that their skill was going to protect them, and it didn't. They got nailed to the wall. So plan your strikes carefully because all out, stay out, that's often exactly what the boss wants from a strike, because a lot of other kinds of strikes, some of which are illegal, which we'll talk about when we talk about <laughs> labor law, but all out strikes are powerful, but they're hard to pull off. So generally, it's often better if you can have a limited strike. Intermittent strikes are illegal, or at least you're not protected. You don't have a right to go back. If you go on strike, you have the right to go back once. Going back and forth, labor law doesn't protect you anymore. So you have to be real careful if you want to do that. But if you can pull it off, it's very distracting uh, or very disruptive for the workplace. Maybe a limited strike in scope in the sense of, well, there are certain people at work who are very knowledgeable 
And everything has to go through this funnel of the workflow. You know, many of you have been involved in these, you know, power mapping exercises where you're looking at a workplace and saying, how, is the, how does work flow? How, where, where can we best interfere with the process here? And that's, this is part of that, is figuring out who has the power to shut things down if they quit working. Uh, and you can get a few people to go out and then everything stops. Uh, and that way, very few people are at risk. Obviously, those people are at high risk, but there are times when that's what makes sense to do. So think about strategy. Here's just some nice pictures from some great strikes from history. Uh, many of you know about the Flint sent down strike. This is one of the early days of the UAW in 1934. The, the power of a sit down strike is if you walk out and pick it, then the boss, if he has some scabs, can have them walk in and run the place. If you sit down at work and don't leave, that doesn't work as well anymore. And that's what the Flint workers did, is they took over the factory and they won. Uh, in 1997, one of the, the first, after many years of few to no really huge strikes and none with wide scale public support, uh, the UPS top leadership had won a TDU supported candidate. Uh, Ron Carey had become president of the Teamsters at a national level. And he wasn't the greatest leader in the world, but he was willing to let strategy be used, which most Teamster leaders have not in recent decades. And so the UPS leadership, which consisted of a lot of Teamsters for Democratic Union members, led this strike against part-time work because companies, not just UPS, but across the country have reduced the number of part-time positions, I mean, the number of full-time positions that get full benefits, not just union jobs, but any most companies, full-time jobs get full benefits, part-time jobs don't. And so companies have gone to more and more part-times. You've even seen this in the academy, you know, where there's fewer and fewer tenure track jobs and more and more of these precarious jobs where, you know, professors don't know from semester to semester if they're gonna have work next, uh, next month. And the 1997 strike was a huge success. It forced UPS to hire a lot more, to, to combine a whole lot of these part-time jobs into full-time jobs. Uh, a little more recently, a little over 10 years ago, the Republic Windows uh, sit-down strike in Chicago, uh, UE again, that I mentioned before. And the boss had lied about all sorts of stuff, about finances and all sorts of shenanigans, and they took over the place and prevented him from selling it and eventually were actually succeeded in buying the place, buying the company. And uh, I think that's still a going concern, run it as a workers' co-op now that they own. So I don't think co-ops are the long-term answer. Ultimately, you can't buy capitalists from the cap buy capital from the capitalists. You have to take it. But it's great to see some examples of how we actually can run it ourselves without their help. So lots of kind of politics and unions, internal, external, uh, and, and big picture stuff. Inside unions, we have local elections. Those are some level of democratic, some more unions more than others. Most unions aren't democratic at a national or international level. I have inter in parentheses because international unions in the US consist of the US, Canada, and Puerto Rico. So it's a little bit international, but we're not talking about you know, Latin America and Europe and Africa and Asia in the same organizations. We're talking about a very limited organization. Top jobs are usually elected at the conventions, which happen every three years or however often they happen, probably at some fancy hotel in Las Vegas. And your local officer goes and the other people, other locals officer goes and they have a nice chummy time and they elect each other and decide what they're gonna get. And they get 10 or hundred times what you get. Uh, in theory, and in, should be in practice, local politics in your union also decides what your union's doing. How much are you spending on organizing? How much are you spending? Uh, how, how militant are you? What, what's your local program in the same way that a socialist organization has a program? Some unions are not as good at internal politics as others, as you might imagine. Most or all unions in the states engage in external politics, electing politicians, shoveling money to mostly Democrats. Uh, Pretty much all of the footwork that goes into Democratic Party politics is done by union members. We do that work. 
then we mostly don't hold them accountable. Uh, so we do a lot of lobbying, going in and asking politicians for things. Occasionally, it's for something actually really exciting, like the PRO Act. Uh, unfortunately, we do a lot of lobbying for sort of little stuff. And in Texas, we're, we're weak enough that we're not able to get as much, nearly as much of that as we'd like. But we do get some stuff. Uh, and two weeks from now, we'll hear some of the TSEU and AFSCME folks talk about what they, what they have been able to get. Again, international politics, the AFL-CIO is part of you know, the International Labor Organization. They do sit down with unions in other countries. I have a feeling they mostly laugh at us when we're not in the room because we're kind of embarrassing as, as, as a union movement. Uh, and because in the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union, US unions I, were on the wrong side. Now, I'm not saying the Stalinists were the right side, but the AFL-CIO in the third world and even in Europe would go in and actively try to undermine red unions. And again, this again, this wasn't, I mean, it happened extensively in Latin America, you know, in our backyard, as, as, the, uh, as the politicians like to say, but the US, the AFL-CIO also did a number on the CGIL, you know, the, at the time, really the only major union, red, uh, the only union in Italy, you know, is the union that was attached to the old communist party, you know, a militant, strong organization, which is still the largest union structure in Italy and by far the most militant, but the AFL-CIO managed to undermine it and cause splits in really destructive ways. So we're not, I suspect, widely respected in the international political scene as a union movement. Capital P politics, US unions mostly don't do this anymore. We're never real good at it, but in the 20s and 30s, we did do it for a while. The Minneapolis general strike was a thing to behold, or so I'm sure I wasn't old enough to have been there, but Farrell Dobbs, who I mentioned before, an old Teamster leader of the era and, and radical socialist, and a bunch of other folks from uh, what became the Socialist Workers Party were leaders of the union there, leaders of the Teamsters Union there, led what turned into a citywide general strike. And that was the day that Minneapolis and Minnesota became union terrain, because it was not before. San Francisco in 1934, same year. It was a, it was a good year for strikes, by the way. Uh, the longshoremen there went on strike uh, in primarily to present the, the shape-up system where the bosses got to pick who worked. But they went on strike. The cops killed two of them and shot a few dozen more. And the unions in the city called a general strike and shut down San Francisco and won. Uh, in modern eras, you will occasionally hear about them in, in various Latin American countries. <laughs> but in the West, the French are the masters of this. They still manage to have one every few years. Uh, in 1995, uh, then Prime Minister Alain Juppé was trying to slash public pensions, and there was a massive general strike, and they shut him down. And this happens every now and then. And two years ago, the current Prime Minister uh, Macron tried to do the same thing, and the same thing happened. So this is what we're fighting for, is to build unions to the point that we can challenge not only our bosses at work, but capital at large. And the only way we can do it is by building this kind of mass militant revolutionary unions. Uh, okay, back to the boring part. Sorry, I'll talk about union structures just for a few minutes and then I wanna turn, turn on the mics again. Unions have constitution and bylaws. Mostly these are horribly bureaucratic documents. Uh, I do wanna read you a little bit of the preamble from the two unions that I have been in. The IWW says among other things that the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. Just black and white, right? Clear as a bell. ATU's preamble includes this. We encourage the principle and practice of conciliation and arbitration in the settlement of all differences between labor and capital. This is basically saying, we surrender. Please be nice to us. Doesn't work. Most unions have some kind of anti-radical language still in their constitution. It's not enforceable uh, legally anymore, but it's still there. They probably have some kind of dual unionism clause in there. This was to uh, deal with uh, IWW members in the old days. 
and in the slightly less old days, CIO folks before the split or after the split and before the reunification. Vertical structure, I talked about local and national. Some unions have a regional structure as well. Most of those are appointed by the national, not elected. So you won't have any control over that, but it exists. Unions have a wide, you know, big unions often have many divisions. The Teamsters used to be largely a uh, craft union. They were freight and warehouse. Uh, at some point they added package, that's UPS. They have a lot of airline workers that they mostly waited from other unions. Uh, that's one of the reasons the, they were expelled from the AFL-CIO in the late eighties was partly because they're incredibly corrupt and mobbed up and partly because they kept uh, um, uh, raiding other unions. They have a lot of construction workers. They have a passenger, uh, buses and trains. They have car hall, they have healthcare. They have a whole bunch of cops and prison officers and such things. They're a general union now. The IBEW is still largely a craft union in that their people are all electrical workers of some sort or another, but they do have a, a variety of divisions, which I didn't know until I went and looked this up. I knew they had construction. I knew they had some manufacturing because I knew they had, they have uh, you know a few manufacturing contracts, not down here, I don't think, uh, although feel free to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, folks who are in the IBW know more about it. They have a bunch of railroad folks who do electrical work uh, in, in the, with, in, on the railroads. They have telecommunication workers, they have utility workers. These are the ones that I think are the big, big sections of the IBEW. So uh, uh, for time reasons, we're not gonna talk about labor law today, uh, but we will talk about that the next couple of weeks. Next week, we'll talk about private sector law and the following week, uh, public sector law. So I'm going to stop sharing. I think I have now stopped sharing. And uh, 